Thank you everyone for joining. The webinar will begin shortly. We wanted to let you know that uh, this is an interactive webinar. You'll hear from several of our panelists, but we would love to hear from you on what you want to have answered. We will have a dedicated question and answer period, and you can send your questions to us the entire time. Uh, use the Q&A feature to send your questions. If you have any other specific pieces, you can also uh, chat us. We do have closed captioning and technical support available. And after the webinar or near the end, we would love your feedback. Please uh, feel free to fill out the feedback form. That really helps us to plan for the future so we can bring you great contact, content and answer the questions you have. And I wanted to also encourage you to join the conversation and follow us on Twitter. With that, we'll begin the webinar. Thank you everyone for joining this uh, National Institute on Aging SBIR SETR virtual workshop series, preparing your NIH SBIR SETR CRP and phase 2B application. This meeting is brought to you by several of our institute partners. We the National Institute on Aging, the National Institute on Neurological Disorders and Stroke, as well as the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, and more broadly, the National Institute on Health. We also want to thank uh, the SEED Fund team. And with that, today you're going to hear from NIA, as well as get specific updates and guidance on the new CRP and Phase 2B applications and opportunities. You'll hear from our partners, NCATS and NINS, You'll also hear directly from a recipient of the CRP, as well as the phase 2B programs. We'll then transition to a moderated Q&A, and as I mentioned, we will have a Q&A function set for you throughout the entire portion. This webinar is being recorded, and we will make the slides available to you after the presentation. With that said, I'd like, you to, like to introduce you to our featured speakers. We have Dr. Todd Heim, who is the Chief at the Office of Small Business Research at NIA. Stephanie Fertig, she is the HHS Small Business Lead at the SEED Office. Lily Portilla, she's a Director of Strategic Alliances at the NCATS NIH. Emily Caparello, she is the Scientific Project Manager the Small Business Program at NINS. Thank you, Dr. Caparello. We also have Dr. Michael Botling. He's a research, and, uh, research director at Apex Biomedical. Kira Shinneman, she's the co-founder and CEO of Diamere. My name is Monique LaRock and I will be your moderator. I wanna thank all of our panelists for joining us today. With that, I'll introduce you to Dr. Todd Heim. Thank you very much, Monique, and thank you to the entire planning team for putting this together. And of course, thank you to each of the panelists. I think each of the panelists will add a lot of value to this. And then finally, last but certainly not least, thank you to the 427 of you and counting, now 429, uh, that have joined this webinar. Um, my wife always says that she can't believe that three people would like to hear me speak, let alone 400 something. So we thank you very much. Um, I'm going to speak. Start. I'm going to start to give an introduction of the National Institute on Aging. Um, we, our office, the of Small Business Research, has six key function areas. First, we centrally coordinate all of the small business and entrepreneurial training efforts across the National National Institute on Aging. Um, we guide applicants um, on potential applications, and that's critical, and we'll talk more about that. You'll hear that a lot through, throughout today. Um, outreach like this webinar to really make sure that we're telling the community about what we have to offer and helping to demystify the process so that the best technologies end up matching and submitting the best applications. Um, funding, seeding specific topic areas. Um, networking, and, and that includes both facilitating connections between our portfolio companies and potential partners, but also working with stakeholders. For example, we have this uh, collaboration with ADDF, where if a company submits a 
phase one and gets awarded from us, they could get bridge funding from the ADDF to cover that period from phase one to phase two. So we're always looking for stakeholders that we can do things like that with. And then entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial training. Next slide. So we strategically fund innovations across a variety of areas, uh, including Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, as well as a lot of areas associated with the aging processes, including aging in place, age-related diseases and conditions, community living for the aging population, research tools, and this lists several of our current additional areas of interest. And the pie chart will show you the types of technologies that we're currently funding. And important to note that we don't try, it's not that we need to hit each one of these percentages, but this is just a snapshot at a moment in time. And it stays pretty consistent from year to year, but there will be small fluctuations based on the quality of applications that come in each year in, in each of these areas. Next slide. So we have several funding opportunities currently available. Of course, we participate in the omnibus funding opportunities, and that will include the phase 2B that you'll hear about today. We, we do participate in the phase 2B through the omnibus. We also have for Alzheimer's disease what I like to call unofficially the Alzheimer's disease omnibus, essentially a parent Alzheimer's solicitation. Um, that it, covers anything relating to Alzheimer's disease, whether, whether it be therapeutics, diagnostics, research tools, digital health, care management, et cetera. Next slide. And important to note for the Alzheimer's disease funding opportunity that I just talked about, we can go up to 500,000 for phase one and 2.5 million for phase two. Remember, every funding opportunity will be specific to the solicitation. So as many of you know, the purpose we were here today, the other purpose is the CRP, the Commercial Readiness Pilot Programs that, Dr. S that Stephanie Fertig will uh, present shortly. Um, and for that, the small one is up to 300,000 and we'll, uh, we will fund large ones up to the total in the solicitation, but we limit it to 1.75 million per year. Uh, so it's not all in the first year. And then we have supplements um, and different initiatives for our current portfolio companies. And then next slide. We also just released two funding opportunities of real high interest to us at the NIA. The first one is for the development of cost effective and customizable training and education platforms for Alzheimer's disease and related dementia caregivers that focus on addressing financial management, legal planning, and other aspects of care management. We also are very interested in another RFA we just released for the preclinical development of novel therapeutics targeting aging mechanisms. This is essentially geroscience-based therapeutic development. And we have pre-application webinars coming for both of us. There'll be a, a way for you to sign up uh, if you're interested um, through the chat and we're, we're sending a sign up uh, link through the chat and we can definitely um, let you know of those webinars. Next slide. So we have several resources for those that have not been awarded by the NIH yet. We do have an applicant assistance program that we participate in. That's a 10 week coaching program to help develop you, uh, to help develop your application. We also have, uh, as you know, you, as you may know, you could apply for technical assistance funds as part of your application. If you're already funded by us, you can apply for diversity supplement. There are several resources through Stephanie's office, the SEED, Small Business Entrepreneurial Education and Development, that uh, you would have access to as a company funded by any institute at the NIH, including the NIA. And finally, we offer entrepreneurial training programs such as C3I for the NIH and i um, at NIH. Next slide. So most importantly, if there's one thing you remember from my talk, is that we are here to help. And we want to help you with an application to make sure that it is a right fit and to make sure that you know what you need to know to actually submit that competitive application. So in order for us to have that conversation and tell you if we think you'll be competitive and what you need to be thinking about, it helps us to have a one pager that, that answers a lot of those questions. And I suggest using the um, specific games page, and here's a suggested template. In that first half to two thirds of the page, you'll want to include that elevator pitch. Out of the thousands of applications we get, why is this the one that the reviewers and the program staff should be most excited about? 
Um, and then in that last third to half a page, the actual aims and key milestones for the project. If you submit that to us at least a month before the deadline, we will make sure that one of our experts will uh, provide guidance to you on that and on your application. Next slide. So I now have the honor of introducing Stephanie Fertig, who is the HHS Small Business Lead uh, at SEED. Stephanie, take it away. Thanks, Todd. Great, so today I'm gonna to provide some updates and guidance on the Commercialization Readiness Pilot Program and the Phase 2B programs that Todd alluded to in his, um, in his talk, but hopefully I'll provide some depth and talk a little bit more broadly uh, across NIH. So as many of you know, the NIH is one of the largest sources of early stage capital for life science funding in the United States. Now, this program is great because it's non-dilutive, it's not a loan, and we find that many applicants can leverage the small business funding to attract investors and partners. And in fact, if you look at the little chart I put here, you can see that often SBIR and STTR funding happens early on in, the, in, a, in a project's life cycle before they're really able to get either investors, whether they be angel investors, venture capital, strategic partners, or they're able to commercialize. And so we recognize since NIH isn't going to likely be the primary purchaser of our SBIR and STTR technologies, that there's often other partners that help take products all the way to the market and in the hands of patients, caregivers, clinicians, and researchers. Next slide. So I'm assuming many of you, although there's a lot of you on this, this webinar, which is great to see, I'm assuming many of you do know about the phased programs of an SBIR and an STTR. So there's the phase one, feasibility study, phase two, further research and development. Uh, you can do something called a fast track, combines the phase one and phase two into one application, or even a direct to phase two for SBIRs if you've already done the phase one feasibility work. Now, regardless of how you get to your phase two, um, we expect that after the phase two, that many of our, of our awardees will get to an inflection point, get to the point where they can attract other investors or partners, um, maybe license out their technologies, or even get to commercialization for some technologies. But for everybody, that isn't the case. And there is often a gap between that phase two and that inflection point. And that's where these programs that we're talking about today really fall. They fall in that, that, that space between the phase two and the inflection point. So that's where there's the competing renewal or the phase 2B and the commercialization readiness pilot or CRP. I would be remiss if I didn't um, talk a little bit about budgeting because we do get a, a large number of inquiries about the budget and the flexibilities associated with the budget. We do have a waiver um, from the Small Business Administration that allows us to award some proposals of, above the normal guidance for an SBIR or STTR. But every institute does have different budget guidance and you see Todd talked a little bit about the NIA's budget guidance. And so it's important again, and I think we're gonna hammer this all home today. It's really, really important to reach out and talk with the program officers, talk with us. We're here to answer questions. We're here to provide that guidance. Now with the programs that we're talking about today, the phase 2B and the CRP, again, there are some differences in budget. Uh, depending upon the institute um, that's participating. And not all institutes participate. So again, that's why it's so important to reach out and talk to your program officer, since if you've, if in order to be eligible for these programs, you have to have a phase two. And so you'll have a program officer associated with that phase two. So important to reach out to them and speak with them. Next slide. So let's talk um, some of the details, some of the big differences between the phase 2B and the CRP, because in that last chart, they looked like they were filling in the same space. Well, there are some unique um, differences between the two of them, and I've tried to highlight them on this slide. But as always, it's really important to reach out to us and read the funding opportunities very carefully. There's a wealth of information in those funding opportunities. And so it's important to read through the funding opportunities that will help you when you're formulating your questions for your program officer. 
So one of the big differences between the CRP and the phase 2B is when can it occur in that, in that product development you know, life cycle. For a phase 2B, they always occur after the phase 1 award. So they're always awarded after the phase 2 award has ended. So the phase two award, so you can come in for a phase two B application at the end of your phase two or after your phase two has ended, and then you'll get awarded once that, that, that grant has concluded. For a CRP, it can happen concurrent with or after the phase two. So you can have a CRP and a phase two at the same time. Another big difference is the outsourcing guidelines. So for the phase two B, it follows the same outsourcing guidelines, so the amount of funding that can go to a subaward. It follows the same outsourcing guidelines as a phase two. For the for the CRP, significant outsourcing is allowed, and in fact, there's an expectation because often the activities that fall under a CRP require more, you know, use of CROs, and so you can do a significant amount of outsourcing with the CRP. Now, how you apply is also very different. Phase 2Bs, some institutes allow Phase 2Bs to come in actually through the omnibus. They accept competing renewals through that omnibus, while others only accept Phase 2Bs through specific funding opportunities. And that's why it's very important to read uh, the program description, um, that is the, the link that's located within the omnibus for each of the different institutes see if they how they accept phase 2b's if they do accept phase 2b's and i put a list of the phase two of the uh, institutes that allow phase 2b's here and again each of them may have different budget guidelines another big difference between another big thing about the phase 2b is and this is brand new for this year it encourages matching funding uh, the phase 2b um, if you read, there's a new phase 2B section as part of the omnibus solicitation, and it clearly indicates that commercial potential, and that's defined as the probability that an application will result in a commercial product, is going to be strongly considered in review and in making funding decisions. Now, while matching funding isn't required, it's encouraged, and the reason it's encouraged is because it's seen as a sign that applicants um, and, and will help validate that commercial potential. But again, not required, but you really have to show that strong commercial potential there. For a CRP, matching funding is not required. Um, and there are three funding opportunities. One is for technical assistance. One is for technical assistance and late stage development. And one is for technical assistance and late stage development that allows clinical trials. I've listed all the institutes uh, that participate in one, in, in one or more of the CRP uh, program announcements here. However, again, it's, it's very important that not all institutes are signed on to every one of these different FOAs. So some, for example, only allow for technical assistance while others do some technical assistance in late stage development. Now, while the phase 2B really covers, basically it's a second phase two, the CRP is a little bit different because it allows you to do things that are normally not part of a phase two. So things like technical assistance associated with development of a regulatory strategy, design and planning for a clinical trial, an intellectual property strategy, including analysis of a patent, the patent landscape, and technical assistance associated with manufacturing. For those that include late stage development, it can include anything from replication studies to IND, IDE enabling studies to validation of assays. Um, and for the ones that include clinical trials, even some clinical trials. So it's, there's a little bit of differences between what the two actually, um, actually allow. But again, the important thing to note is it's really important to contact your program official. Talk about what your next steps are talk about what your company needs, and then they can help you decide what's the best path for you to moving forward. So next slide. So as uh, Todd indicated, I am part of SEED. So SEED is a word, it's, it's, you know, the SBIR and STTR program is America's SEED Fund, but it also stands for Small Business Education and Entrepreneurial Development. So beyond the phase two and the CRP, there was a real recognition that again, a lot of companies 
may be brand new. You know, people, this may be their first company. They may be academics and transitioning out into the small business world for the first time. And we really needed to do broader support of the NIH innovator community and really help our NIH innovators move things again towards the clinic to be able to help NIH meet its mission of turning discoveries into health. And so in addition to supporting the SBIR and STTR program, we also provide uh, different programs in, in academic innovation and innovator support. And today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about that innovator support piece. So next slide. So there's a number of commercialization, there's some commercialization support that you can get uh, across NIH. And this is part of, again, the SBIR program, but also more broadly. So there is technical and business assistance that you can ask for either as part of your application, and I put the budget amounts here, and Todd alluded to this as well, um, or through a centralized program. And historically, that was the, the niche assessment program and the commercializ commercialization accelerator program. Uh, those two programs have ended. And one of the things that we can say is coming soon is the needs assessment program um, that, that we're planning to launch. However, we also have, again, because many of our applicants are brand new to, to the whole uh, business enterprise, different entrepreneurial assistance and training, and that's through i or the C3I program. Now, as I alluded, many of uh, some of these, these more trans-NIH technical assistance programs um, are either ending or some new ones may be starting. So again, you can always look and see what's our currently available technical assistance and training on the SBIR website, and I put a link here. Next slide. So but beyond those uh, technical assistance and, and more formal technical assistance training programs, at SEED, we provide strategy, finance, and access to these commercialization experts. So we have a senior regulatory specialist on staff and we have entrepreneurs and residents. And these individuals help companies transition and again, get to that point, you know, move them down the product development pathway. In addition, we provide partnering opportunities and pitch coaching opportunities to our awardees. And it used to be all across the country. Now it's, it's very virtual, um, but we still provide opportunities for companies to go to some of these different events to, again, meet with potential partners, we meet with potential investors uh, to move things forward. Next slide. So there's a lot of things and a lot of details, and I always encourage people to go to our website. We have a wealth of information on our website. I pointed out where you can find information on funding here, as well as information on that technical assistance. So if you don't want to remember the specific web, all the specific websites I've pointed to, sbir.nih.gov is a great place to start. Next slide. And it's always important and the most important piece of advice, and I think we're all going to hammer that home again today, is to talk with us well in advance of application, particularly for these phase 2B and CRP applications, since there are some specific uh, policies and parts of the application you're going to want to make sure you include. It's really important to talk to your program official well in advance. And you can find a list of all the program officers and different program coordinators for the small business programs on our website. Next slide. So I encourage you to get connected as different things get released, such as the Omnibus Every Year or the Commercialization Readiness Pilot Programs. Contact us. Uh, subscribe to the listserv. Follow us on Twitter. Check the email. Check, check our um, website. If you have questions, can ask the program officer, but you can also email us. Um, we do have an online inquiry form, but you can also email us at sbir at od.nih.gov, and we'll try to help you. And with that, I think we're transitioning. Excellent. To Lily. Thank you. And before Lily begins, I just want to remind folks to please uh, fill out the feedback form, as well as uh, if you check out chat, many of the resources that we're talking about, we're linking to. So feel free to take a look at those links or copy them at your leisure. We'll also plan to send the deck after this. We've received a couple of questions about that. We will make that available as well as we will email some of the links we've discussed. Thank you. And with that, Lily, please take it away. 
Uh, thanks, Monique, um, and thanks, Todd, for um, uh, offering this opportunity to collaborate with NIA. Um, I'm Lily Portilla. I'm the Director of Strategic Alliances. My office puts together all the collaborations for NCATS, but we also run the SBIRS TTR program for the center. Uh, next slide. So NCATS is, um, we, we focus on translation, and I, I don't want to um, shortchange the other institutes by saying that they don't do translational work, but we're, our, our focus is more on bottlenecks around translation and all the way from preclinical development to uh, uh, clinical development um, of, of technologies. Um, we uh, have an interest in platform-like technologies. We are disease agnostic, um, and, but at the same time, we do have an interest on uh, certain rare and neglected diseases as well, too. Um, next slide. So I wanted to specifically uh, focus on the phase 2B and CRP programs and how we, um, our grantees can engage in these uh, specific programs. So for both the phase 2B and the CRP, we we here uh, at NCATS have to be supporting uh, your, your phase two grant, um, meaning that you can't come from another institute that you're currently being funded under a phase two to apply to NCATS. Um, for a phase two B, uh, we want to talk to all applicants before they apply to us to make sure that um, the work that you wanna do can be supported by um, NCATS because, um, an, 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 uh, we do not accept any clinical trial uh, work under our SBRS TTR program. So we wanna make sure that your uh, phase 2B will not be focusing on any kind of clinical trials. Um, so, and the other reason too, is that we wanna make sure that we can support the budget that you would like to submit under the phase 2B program. For, for the CRP, um, NCATS part participates in uh, one of the uh, CRP um, funding announcement and our cap for funding cap for um, our institute is uh, 300,000. Um, and again, always a good idea to have a conversation with us about what it is that you would like to do under the program and to make sure that, that it's a good fit, uh, uh, that it makes sense and that um, we're all on board before you submit your application. So. Um, for both of these programs, it's always good to talk to myself or one of the other um, NCATS program officers. Next slide. So um, I talked about a little bit earlier about the types of applications that NCATS focuses on. I think uh, our topics fit into three general buckets. Um, so preclinical drug discovery and development tools and technologies. Um, biomedical health and clinical research informatics. Uh, we have an interest in that, as well as um, clinical and uh, uh, dissemination and implementation research. Um, for that last bucket, it's things like how to do better clinical studies, um, tools to make that happen, IRB uh, management tools, uh, recruitment tools. Um, and we also uh, like to fund things that are a good, um, um, uh, that uh, align well with other programs that we have. We have the Clinical uh, Translational Science Award program uh, that we uh, manage out of NCATS. We also have um, uh, the Office of Rare Disease Research and they have some initiatives as well that dovetail nicely with some of the things that we are looking to um, fund under our SBRS TTR program. Uh, another uh, big program that we have at uh, NCATS is the tissue chip program. And uh, there again, we are looking for applications that may uh, be addressing microphysiological systems um, and how to use them to do drug testing. So, um, if you look at some of the other programs that we have at NCATS, we always like to leverage SBIR to also fund um, topically some uh, things that align with those big, uh, with those larger programs that the center funds. Next slide, please. I want to talk about two uh, programs that are available for small businesses. The first one is uh, the Bridges program. And Bridges is um, a resource program that allows you to 
um, uh, bring in a clinical candidate when it's identified. Um, we take any disease area and what we do is do a gap analysis to figure out uh, what kind of studies you may need, be needing um, in order to get you to an IND filing. And um, our involvement um, is to get you to uh, that inflection point of an IND filing. It's a milestone driven program. We use our uh, contract research organizations uh, that we have um, um, at NCATS to do some of the work. Some of the work is done in-house and we accept all sorts of therapeutic modalities um, under the, the program. The next, next slide, please. The next program, uh, which runs a little bit uh, the same way as the Bridges is the TREND program. And here you do have to have a, um, um, a disease that meets FDA, orphan or WHO neglected tropical disease criteria. Um, unlike the Bridges program where we exit at the time, uh, we try to get you to an IND filing here under trend, we can go up to a phase 2A clinical trial to assist you uh, with some resources again to get you uh, to a phase 2A. Uh, again, we accept all sorts of uh, therapeutic modalities. Uh, we do a gap analysis to determine what you need in order to get you to um, certain key inflection points in your development of your, um, of your therapeutic. Uh, you, you can enter at various stages of preclinical development, like when you have a lead identified or maybe uh, you need to get some talk studies done or um, um, a scale up uh, and manufacture of, of the therapeutic that you're working on. Um, and again, uh, all these programs are resource programs and uh, uh, they accept applications on a rolling basis. Next slide, please. So here is a quick example of how you can leverage SBIR and uh, the Bridges and Trend program. So we had an academic investigator who had developed a new um, molecular entity for a, a treatment of a rare disease and she'd cobbled together enough money uh, using R01 funding and STTR to about $3.5 million. Um, did a lot with that money, uh, went to a pre-IND meeting and found out from the FDA that she needed to get uh, two very critical um, um, tox, animal tox studies done in order to get her to an IND filing. And she was kind of stuck. Um, she couldn't really progress using her own funding um, because the studies uh, totaled about $500,000. And, and just getting that funding via an SBR, STTR could be a, a heavy lift. Um, and it was time sensitive, she, you know, she needed to get the, the studies done. So she came to the Bridges program. We looked at the data she had and, and we figured out that we could indeed help her by um, enlisting some of the CROs that we had um, uh, working for us to get the, the animal studies done. We were able to provide her the data. Uh, she was successfully filed an IND and as a result of doing that, she was able to raise about $50 million worth of VC Series A's funding. So this is a great example of how you can leverage the two programs um, to get you to key um, inflection points in the development of your technology. So I believe that concludes my uh, slides. Uh, um, and if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat. Thanks a lot for your time today. Thank you, Lily, and uh, thank you, Stephanie, as well. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Emily Caparello. Emily, um, you may be on mute, and while she's doing that, I just wanted to note that Emily is the Scientific Project Manager at NINS, and she'll provide a bit more information about their program. I'm going to suggest that we um, move ahead and then yes. we will. Yes, Emily. Monique, let's move ahead to the next speaker. Um, Emily is having Zoom issues. So uh, let's go ahead to the next speaker and then we'll come back. Thank you.
So now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Botling. He is the R&D Director at Apex Biomedical and is going to provide some feedback from the point of view of someone who's received the award in the past. Thank you. Well, thank you, Stephanie and Todd, for inviting me. And thank you for the support again. Um, this CRP was really conducted in collaboration between Stephen Mady. He's an orthopedic surgeon and myself. I am trained in biomedical engineering. And this project was about making better, safer bicycle helmets based on the fact that brain injury comes from mainly from a rotational spin to the head, not so much from a linear impact. And um, uh, this is a fundamental but little understood fact. And as an engineer, I started out by making computer models and showing that. And the feedback was always less than enthusiastic. And my collaborator, Dr. Mady, said, Michael, make an egg video. And I told him, as a train engineer, I'm not making egg videos. But he kept pushing me. So I finally made it just to make it go away. And that would be the next slide. If you can play that video, please. This model shows how important rotation of the head is in brain injury. To demonstrate this, we place two egg yolks inside a head model. When we shake the model, the eggs slosh back and forth. Next, we fill the model to the top with water and seal the system, simulating the brain enclosed in the skull. In this system, the brain and surrounding fluid act as one when exposed to an external force. Notice how the eggs no longer move back and forth in this sealed system, no matter how hard we shake them in a linear fashion, even in a hard hit exceeding 100 Gs. Most impacts are angled, not purely linear. When we angle the impact and allow the model to spin, the yolks shear, simulating concussion or traumatic brain injury. Traditional helmets are not optimized to prevent this type of spin. Even though no helmet can prevent all injuries, WaveCell is engineered to drastically reduce the forces that cause these injuries. So the challenge of our um, CRP grant was really translating this wave cell technology into a consumer product, into a simple and uh, effective method. But that also required that we translate our scientific approach in a method that anybody can understand from the consumer to reviewers to the people we collaborate with. So um, for us, for anybody, the CRP application is two big parts, a research strategy, and a commercialization plan. So they are bare to write, but this is very essential homework because in order to execute any business plan, you need exactly those strategies. Um, you start by defining the magnitude of the health challenge. In our case, it was brain injury. That's fairly obvious. Uh, you wanna highlight the innovation of your technology. In our case, that's, that's a wave cell, a type of honeycomb that is uniquely designed to fold over, flex, and be integrated into a helmet to serve as a rotational bearing to protect those egg yolks you saw in the video. And then you can outline the impact and benefits it has in reducing the severity and incidence of brain injury, but also the benefits on a commercial side by building a business in the US that now employs people. And by us bringing out a new technology, now there are many other companies that all of a sudden start changing the way they design helmets. So it brings the whole field forward. And to do that, we started with four simple milestones. The first one was streamline manufacturing parameters. How can we make what worked in the lab cheaper? The next milestone was develop a production process. How can we make a lot of it? The next milestone, implement a quality system, is something I feel should be in any CRP proposal because if on a milestone two you start making something in a large quantity, you want to make sure the quality is right. Otherwise, you have a really large problem. And uh, milestone number four is really home to us researchers because it was about testing our final product, how it compares to a standard helmet how big is the advancement in numbers? Uh, next slide, please. In terms of the research strategy, I just shared here a simplified table. Again, you see the four milestones. And I would recommend to keep the goals 
simple and realistic. We focused just on bicycles and just on a single helmet model. Milestone one, deliverables. We wanted to have a 30% cost reduction to make it actually feasible as a consumer product. Milestone two, we need to develop a machine that produces this material in large quantities. And you see in the lower half of the slide, we have our collaborators. The CRP is ideally suited to support you with hiring consultants and outsourcing. Here we use a company called Sigma Design. They have over 100 engineers that do nothing else but building production equipment. For milestone number three, we hired a quality consultant because that was really a world we didn't even know about. So they could help us making a sound quality system. Milestone number four, we did in-house testing, but we can again outsource to uh, outside parties so we have stronger evidence for the performance of our technology. Uh, next slide, please. The second part of the CRP grant is the commercialization plan. So you wanna know your market size. To get to those marketing data, sometimes you need to spend some money to get those data, but that money can be very well invested because you might think like, everyone talks about football, let's make football helmets. But based on market analysis, you would find that that's actually a fairly small market. Bicycling worldwide is way, way bigger. You want to know your competition. In the graph on the right, you see how we tested standard helmets, our main competitor, our prototypes, and where we got a very good feel, can we really move the needle, advance the field? Now comes the very most important, important third step. You want to carefully select strategic partners. And there, the most important part is really the marketing. Um, because without marketing, no one would take up our technology. It's the most important thing. And marketing can be very, very expensive. Um, in this case, we licensed our technology exclusively to track uh, the Bicycle Corporation. They have a good reputation. Um, interestingly, the engineers believed right away in our data, but they would have never licensed it unless they saw that funny egg video, because that's where leadership could buy in right away. Now, by bringing them into the loop, I bet they spent upwards of $1 million for the global release uh, a little bit over a year ago. So again, with the right partner, you can leverage everything you do. Um, you of course select carefully your consultants for business, for quality. Um, our best consultant was really uh, OMAP. It's an Oregon nonprofit uh, organization. I think that exists in most states. These are senior experienced people that try to help you in surviving your business. Um, with the CRP, we also got a lot of requests from other people that promised us the sky in terms of consulting services. They probably also charged the sky. So I would always start with a nonprofit local organization that is set up to help you. You want to end your conversation plan uh, probably with a long term strategy. It shows you can think outside the box. Whatever works in a bicycle helmet, does it have merit for military, for other sports? Uh, I kept that section short because it's speculative and we want to keep the goals realistic and simple. Uh, next slide, please. So now I only have three more slides that share after you have the CRP, what were lessons that we learned? I think the one is we do need to get some form of electro intellectual property such as patents or trademarks, because they really create value of what you created. And that's critical if you want to license to others because you locked up the field, it's yours. Someone else wants to own it and run with it and invest a million in marketing. Um, while you do that uh, patent work with a patent lawyer, you also have to read through a lot of other patents with related technology. And that gives you the confidence that you have the freedom to operate. There will be nothing worse of you investing a lot of time just to find out someone else had a patent and now you kind of infringe in their field. Next slide, please. There's always the balance between organic growth versus 
bringing in early investors. It's very attractive to have a lot of money, um, but it's not always easy. Our experience was that business expansion costs way more than we planned, both during the CRP phase and now after the CRP phase. And that's partly because of technology installation. It just takes longer than you plan for that, just like research. Um, we still st stuck so far with the organic growth model. So we're always right at the edge of having enough money to pay everyone. And, um, but it's a real privilege because we have no outside investor influence so far that allows us to be completely data driven and not financially driven. And on the financial side, it allows us to grow and create value before investors buy in. So that's just my personal uh, experience. Um, next slide, please. And that is really the last slide. Probably the most important one, skin in the game versus outsourcing. So you get a CRP and you now have the money to give it to other people that kind of can do the job for you. But that's not always how it works. Um, yes, you absolutely need consulting. Um, on the right side, you see a machine. Now, this is not the machine that we outsourced to Sigma, where we had over 100 engineers that were building machines all day long. Their product came late and it never worked and it almost put us out of business. And I had to look around in-house. We had a few engineers. We saw what they did. We, we learned from it and we built in house our own machine. And, uh, and now it works actually better than we ever hoped for and we have the in-house knowledge. So if you can hire expertise in-house it just makes you so much stronger and what you cannot do is trust someone that you outsource to that they will do the job right i think you really need to have skin in the game be involved and learn with them uh, the crp will change your career it certainly did mine um the the dream that oh with that money i just outsource and it will it will go smooth i doubt that will ever work by staying involved, it actually made my career way more exciting. Um, we have a big poster with feedback from bicyclists that crashed and report how they didn't get a concussion. So that direct feedback to a researcher is like the highest motivation I could imagine. Of course, it will be like a roller coaster. And um, I don't think a roller coaster is fun if you're sitting by yourself. So I cannot emphasize enough the value of having a partnership. In our case, it was Dr. Mady as a surgeon, myself, and we can bounce that years back and forth and basically share the burden and, and walk through it together. And uh, without that CRP, we would have not able to translate our technology. And with it, it really, really helped us big time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Batlang, for not only sharing how this product is going to help make a difference in the lives of people, but also a few tips on um, how to be successful. Uh, with that, I want to turn back to Dr. Emily Caparello, who is back with us. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much, Michael, not only for uh, covering for me while I recovered from my Zoom crash, but also for that fantastic presentation and insight into your experience and guidance for the community. I'm gonna to talk to you all today a little bit about NINDS and some of the funding opportunities we have available for small businesses. I'm gonna start by going over the NINDS mission space and uh, the indications that we support. So NINDS is one of several institutes that supports neuroscience research and development. Um, specifically, NINDS supports uh, indications in the neurological space, which includes stroke, epilepsy, neurodegenerative disorders, spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, neurogenetic disorders, and uh, many other indications that fall under neurology. If you're not sure whether your project would fit under the NINDS mission, I very much encourage you to reach out to either myself or my colleague, Dr. Natalie Trzinski, and we'll be happy to either confirm your alignment with our mission or refer you to the appropriate institute. Next slide, please. I'm gonna to focus today on the funding opportunities under the phase 2B and CRP programs. NINDS does support applications for both of these mechanisms. For phase 2B, we uh, do not participate for in phase 2B funding under the omnibus. 
we have a separate funding opportunity announcement for phase 2B applications. For preclinical applications, this is PAR 17480. And for clinical research or clinical trial applications, this is PAR 18665. Both of these applications support awards up to a million dollars per year for up to three years. And both of these funding opportunities strongly encourage matching funds. For the CRP program, NINDS participates in both of the technical assistance and late stage development funding opportunities. This includes the preclinical funding opportunity, PAR 20129, and the clinical trial late stage development opportunity, PAR 2130. Importantly to note for NINDS, our phase 2B uh, applications that are proposing a clinical trial do require applications to include an approved IND, IDE, or an indication of non-significant risk from the FDA or your IRB at the time of submission. And while this is not, these materials are not required for CRP applications to NINDS per the FOAs, NINDS does prioritize funding to applications that have these materials at the time of application. Again, we very much encourage you to reach out to our program staff if you are considering applying to NINDS, uh, especially for phase 2B or CRP opportunities, and we'll be happy to discuss your project with you. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, and again, everyone, please uh, feel free to reach out to some of the contacts you've heard from today. We have chatted their emails and contact information if you want to learn more about each of the institutes. Uh, I also want to encourage you to fill out those feedback forms and continue to send in your questions. We are tracking them all and we'll get to them shortly. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kira Shinneman. She's the co-founder and CEO of Diamere. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Kira Scheinerman, the CEO of Diamir. We are a molecular diagnostics company focused on developing blood-based tests for early detection and monitoring of brain diseases. We have been working with the NIA since 2013 and I'm most grateful to their continuing support. Next slide, please. As a way of brief introduction, Diamir has developed a proprietary diagnostic platform technology based on the analysis of organ-enriched microRNAs in blood plasma. Our first product is in development currently. It is Cognimir for early diagnosis and prediction of progression of Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment, including in clinical trial setting, which is a huge unmet need. We collaborate with uh, academic labs and pharma, as well as with disease foundations. Next slide, please. This slide depicts the core of our technology. Once synapse dysfunction and loss begin in early Alzheimer's, microRNAs enriched in the affected brain regions and present in synapses appear in the extracellular space and can be captured in the blood as biomarkers of neurodegeneration. To date, we completed proof of principle and confirmatory studies in over 1,000 samples, built a strong IP portfolio, and published our work in peer-reviewed journals as well as presented at relevant scientific and industry conferences. Next slide, please. I would like to touch briefly upon competitive landscape. While significant progress has been made in recent years um, with such diagnostic methods as neuroimaging and cerebrospinal fluid analysis, they are invasive, time-consuming, and expensive, and as such are not suitable for primary testing. Therefore, there is a growing interest and need in blood-based and digital biomarkers to diagnose the disease early and to facilitate drug development. The advantages of Cognimir include inherent specificity of the test, ability to combine multiple microRNA molecules in one classifier, in other words, multiplexing, which is more challenging to do, for example, with protein markers, and complementarity with other biomarkers. Next slide, please. Although today's discussion is focused uh, mostly on phase 2B and CRP, I would like to provide some background for how our program has advanced from one stage to the next. We had began this program in 2013 with SBIR phase one grant awarded by the NIA. We only got it from the second try though. This was our first application and a tremendous learning experience. 
we revise the application after the the first submission based on the reviewer's comments and receive the award. Big part of phase one studies is generating data that can convince key opinion leaders in the field that further investigation and evaluation should be granted because you need strong academic collaborators and they like to see data. Just a few words on the importance of establishing strong collaborations. Collaborators contribute expertise as well as valuable technical assistance. The nature of such assistance, of course, depends on the technology you're developing. In our case, these are well-characterized plasma samples. Access to good samples is one of the main challenges and bottlenecks in molecular diagnostics research. In addition to funding, the NIH also provided support through a consulting firm that conducted market research analysis for us that included survey of pharma companies, in other words, our prospective partners. It was very informative and we used it when drafting our phase two application. So our initial hypothesis was confirmed by phase one studies and we continue to develop the program through phase two and phase two B. Validation is the key in phase two. The question becomes, can you replicate and expand your, your proof of principle studies? If the answer is yes, like uh, likely was in our case, then the technology might be developed into a commercial product uh, you saw the need for and envisioned from the beginning, or maybe some modified version of that. At that point with phase 2B, the focus shifts to preclinical and analytical assessment and validation, creating protocols, uh, etc. Next slide, please. Uh, I would like to share some of our takeaways with you today, what actually worked for us. We always write all our applications ourselves, uh, as uh, Michael emphasized uh, uh, before, uh, using consultants is very important, consultants with applicable expertise, but uh, it is our strong belief that you should have the ownership of, of the application of your product because you are the most excited about it. Of course, you would like to cross all T's and dot all I's and, and make the final product uh, terrific. Um, but, but, but we do believe that you should be in charge as the application, both research strategy as well as commercialization plan come together. Um, the data is key um, to move from one stage to the next uh, and, and, and uh, to, to, to commercialization. Of course, you need to ha have this data. And at some point, you need to make the staff decision of go or no go. Sometimes uh, phase one data may not be as exciting. And then, you, you, you know, it, it, it's tough to, to, to take it, but, uh, but it may not, the program or the project may not be phase two or phase two B material. Um, and um, while our lead program in uh, uh, brain uh, diseases um, has been successful uh, so far, um, we, we had to, to take those, make those decisions uh, with, with some of the other programs. Um, now, uh, an important thing is, uh, as also Michael mentioned, is patents. And uh, while S uh, CRP uh, does allow for some of the funding to go towards IP, phase one and phase two and phase two B are not as generous in this regard. So uh, I would recommend if you do receive those awards, use the 7% fee that you can um, use uh, and apply to anything wisely because of course creating IP is very important uh, and, and, and publishing your work in uh, high profile journals is also very important because this way you attract key opinion leaders uh, to work with you. Uh, we collaborate a lot, we partner a lot, uh, and um, we constantly talk to prospective investors as well, financial advisors. So when the time came, we uh, received uh, very enthusiastic letters of support from our collaborators, from our pharma partner, uh, as well as from um, our financial advisor as well. 
uh, it is important to show we believe that others, third parties, are enthusiastic about your technology and approach, not just you. And of course, uh, uh, the main key components of commercialization plan are the same uh, as when you, for example, pitch to investors. How strong is your uh, management team? Do you know your direct and indirect competition? Do you know your market, the size of your market? Uh, how do you plan to, to launch the product and market? These are all important questions. Uh, if you have already started speaking with uh, you know, private investors or venture groups, uh, this is the same questions they ask as well. Um, again, uh, engage the relevant expertise through consultants. All small companies um, typically have uh, a number of consultants. It's hard to afford everybody full time. So, so we work with many consultants. And finally, for a small company, we feel it is important to stay focused, some um, even say uh, laser focused, uh, just because uh, it's easy to get distracted and continue to generate relatively early data, maybe in different indications, for example, whereas it is important from business perspective to continue pushing uh, the lead program um, to later stages. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. I want to turn it over to Todd to review a few application resources. Great. Uh, yeah, so, and Stephanie mentioned some of these as well. There, there are sample grant applications available uh, through the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And while these are focused in that space, I think they have applicability, especially to the pharma-related projects across the NIH. Um, we also will, um, we have an annotated form set that kind of walks through each of the forms in the different boxes. Uh, especially if you haven't applied for an SBIR before, definitely suggest you click on that link for the SBIR STDR application process infographic uh, that's available through Stephanie's office. Um, and then the website for our office for those interested in NIA specifically. Um, and if you are submitting an application and looking for, well, what else have we funded related to your technology? Definitely look at the NIH reporter. You could also use it to look at for potential uh, collaborators. Anything that the NIH funds, whether it's through all ones or small business, it will all end up the abstract and the PI information, everything else will end up in NIH reporter, just the abstract, the PI, the contact information, and the budget totals. Um, so definitely use that as a great database and then some Alzheimer's related databases are here as well. And feel free to connect with all of us. Each of our contact information has been listed in the chat as well as on our slides and we look forward to talking to many of you. I also look forward to you know the next uh, half an hour or so we may be able to go a little longer to cover uh, a lot of the questions, we have a lot of questions that came in, which is great, and we look forward to a dynamic discussion. Thank and you. finally, I just want to thank the panelists. Um, I think they represent the scientific diversity of our portfolio. We, while most of the funds do go to farm-related projects like therapeutics, devices, the diagnostics that are regulated by FDA, we also, um, fund projects that are not regulated like FDA. And Michael showed you one example, but the, those projects can be research tools, they can be digital health, consumer devices. So the, there is a, a breadth in terms of what we look to fund. And you know, if you ever have any questions about that, please feel free to let us know. Thank you. Thank you, Todd, and all of our panelists. Um, we will now be moving into the Q&A feature. Um, we are still accepting questions. We have received just under 100. So as Todd mentioned, um, we will extend this webinar to go to about 2.50 Eastern time. Um, but we recognize that not everyone will be able to stay the whole time. We will try to get through as many questions as we can. We have several links and resources that may be able to answer some of your questions that have been chatted out. Um, we will also combine some of the questions. So if you don't hear your wording exactly, it's because it was very similar to someone else's. 
and then lastly, please just a reminder to uh, contact the ICs, the institutes and centers that you've heard from today. Uh, it's very important to talk to a program director before submitting your application. And please fill out the feedback form. With that, we'll move over into a few of the, the questions. Uh, the first question relates to figuring out um, which program and when. So um, which program between the phase 2B and the CRP has more funds? And is there a greater chance of uh, being selected for one over the other? Stephanie or so I am going to turn it over to you know Todd and Emily and Lily to answer that because that's the kind of question if you are specifically trying to decide what makes the most sense for you and your project, you can ask questions about how does a specific institute, the specific institute that's supporting your phase two, how they utilize the CRP and the phase two B programs. So at the NIA, um, Essentially, the CRP and the Phase 2B don't have funding set asides. So we evaluate those in comparison to all the other projects and to each other. So, you know, I don't think, I don't think it would make, if you got a same score in a CRP or a Phase 2B, I don't think it would make a difference which one you apply to. That being said, I think, as Stephanie went through, they, they each have their own kind of specifics and you know, some projects are likely better and may score better if it's submitted as a CRP or as a phase 2B. So, you know, my recommendation would be to figure out which program is a best fit for the project and that would give you your best chance. And that's, as Stephanie said, something I'm happy to guide you on. I would echo that from NINDS. Um, we don't necessarily we don't have a separate set aside amount for CRP versus phase 2B. And we would guide applicants to look at the unique features of each mechanism. So as Stephanie mentioned, CRP has a broader, um, a broader selection of activities that are available to be funded under that mechanism that go into the technical assistance areas. There's also different requirements as far as matching funding or outsourcing. And so it really depends on the specific project that you're pursuing on um, whether one mechanism would make more sense. So I um, completely agree to start with a discussion with the program officer at the relevant institute. I, I don't have any more to add for NCATS other than um, if you want to apply to either program, please talk to me or one of the other program officers before you go in putting the application. Like I said, I want to make sure that it's a good fit what you want to do for for NCATS that it makes sense in terms of the, what we just previously funded via the the phase two uh, so have a conversation with us before you apply yeah and let me add one thing we we have been putting in you know email addresses such as Dr. MD Kearns in our office that uh, can handle a lot of application questions but if you already have a phase two and are at the point where you're thinking about a phase two B or CRP strongly, strongly recommend that your first contact actually be to the program officer that is already the program officer on your phase two because they would know the project the best and they would be the best first contact. And we all work closely together. So, you know, if your program officer, if they have questions about some of the business questions or the specifics about the CLP, they'll connect you to me and we'll have a call together. But, but it's always best to start with that program officer. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Stephanie. Will the information that was presented today be applicable to other NIH institutes? So I tried to present general and broad information associated with, NI with NIH as a whole. And again, since each individual institute may have different budget guidance, um, may participate in some program announcements versus others, some institutes do the CRP versus some institutes only do you know, the phase 2B and vice versa. It's really important, again, as Todd was saying, that first contact, that program officer, that you, if you've for both of these programs, you need to have had a war, an awarded phase two. And so it's important that you um, use that program officer contact, talk to them, and they'll help guide you on what is available through other institutes. Thank you. 
One participant noticed that SBIR is listed on some slides, but not STTR. Can we assume that programs are available for both or are some only SBIR focused? So I can say that's a great catch. And, uh, and I usually try to state that um, oftentimes we will shorthand the SBIR and STTR programs. So we'll say, um, we'll say SBR and STTR and then, re you know, or just say SBIR and really mean both. That said, um, some institutes only accept phase 2Bs for their SBI, you know, through the SBIR mechanism. So you, you have to be an SBIR to get a phase 2B. In those situations, um, and this is again important to reach out and talk with the program officers, but for those STTRs that are phase 2, if the institute only allows for phase 2B SBIRs, you'd have to transition to be a phase 2B SBIR. So you'd have to transition into the SBIR program um, for the, that phase 2B. Again, this is something that you should talk with your program officer about. They can help talk you through that. Yeah, similarly to note, the director phase two program is also only SBIR, but estimates that many of the others are SBIR, STTR, or SBIR where you can transition or convert from an STTR to an SBIR. That's yeah, right. Yeah, uh, for NCATS, it only applies to SBIR for the phase two B, so. Thank you. I have a few questions for Lily that speak to the Trend and Bridges program. Is the Trend program available for medical devices? Uh, it is not. Um, it is, it, it's also not available for vaccine development. It's mostly um, uh, some uh, therapeutics, large, small molecule, gene therapy, um, st some stem cell-like therapy, um, cell therapy. Uh, but not, unfortunately, not devices or vaccines at this time. What are the funding caps for Bridges? There are no funding caps for Bridges, um, and that is because um, if your po project does get selected for to be onboarded, uh, the team will be doing um, a, a gap analysis to figure out what it, what studies you may need in order to get you to these key inflection points, right? Um, uh, and um, as a result, and again, you're use, it's a resource program. We're not handing over money to you, but you're able to get access to resources that we have via our um, uh, CROs that do all sorts of uh, different uh, type work. Um, uh, you know, some of it, can be depending on what you need. You know the the example I gave of the of the person with the new uh, rare disease drug um, needed help that was around half a million dollars. Some of our projects are several million dollars, but again, it, it very de much depends on what you need, what stage of development you're in, um, and uh, that discussion happens with our um, uh, scientific group that runs both Trend and Bridges. Thank you. And the last two questions on these programs, does the applicant need to have prior NIH funding to be eligible? And can you speak to the IP joint ownership between the small business and the agency through Bridges and Trend? Um, you do not have to have previous NIH funding. Um, I would say that probably half of our applicants um, don't. They're um, small businesses that don't even have SBIR. Some of them do. Um, and as for IP development, this program um, is a little different. It, it sits on the intramural side of NIH. That's our internal R&D program. So if you are working with, our, uh, with either Trend or Bridges and those individuals um, may, may or may not be involved in, uh, in co-development of an IP, of IP, for example, if you're um, scaling up your, your um, your uh, compound or something, that may not be very much of an IP generating event. But if you're doing medicinal chemistry and our folks are chemists, there is a possibility that we may be directing some of that and therefore generating IP as, again, um, you know, per standards of what constitutes an inventor on intellectual property per US PTO law. So it very much depends on your project. It depends on what we're doing. Um, uh, but 
um, I applicants sometimes say to us that, you know, I don't want to dilute my IP with government involvement. I would say then if you're potentially going to have a situation like that, that we're not the right fit then. Then, then don't apply to the program. Then it's best that you go to a CRO and take care of that work. But um, the added benefit of coming to NCATS with those two pr programs is that you're getting um, not only access to the CROs, but the expertise that goes along in, in, in putting together a study, um, um, uh, again, that you might need, um, some of the regulatory assistance that you may need, and project management that goes along with every one of these projects. Thank you, Lily. I'll next move to some specific questions from Michael. Michael, starting from scratch, what were some of the resources that helped you in writing a successful CRP proposal? Um, so, of course, uh, during the phase one and phase two, you lay the groundwork for the CRP proposal. And um, I couldn't agree more with Kira that it's in-house, we didn't have any external support in writing that proposal. It's sitting the team around a table and figuring out what do we need to do when there were specific areas that we couldn't fill out like a commercial commercialization plan. Uh, that's when we reached out to the Oregon Manufacturing Extension Partnership already during that early phase um, or anybody you can find uh, as an early consultant, hopefully not for profit or through your organization. I probably made the failure and did not reach out to my program officer as I should have. Um, but um, yeah, it was all homegrown and we felt very comfortable with that. Thank you. And where can folks learn more about your helmet? Um, wavecell.com that's with one l at the end thank you and monique if i can take a moment to put a plug uh this virtual education session is the second in a series that we're going to be trying to do to offer web-based training and education to the nih community it will really trying to figure out what types of topics you need to learn about and you want to learn about and that's why that feedback form is absolutely critical so the links are in the uh chat and they'll chat it again and please 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 fill that out tell us what other topics you would like the next session to be about um, so that we can make sure we are designing these to help you specifically and i can also state that um michael did reach out to the program officer before applying. I remember it. So um, he definitely <laughs> did that. So always recommended. Thank you. I'll move over to some questions about budget limits and then specific questions for Kira. Uh, is the 50,000 for technical assistance in a phase two a direct cost and is it included in the budget limit? That's a great question. Um, so there's specific uh, instructions regarding how to put in the, the technical and business assistance or TABA costs into the application where it's listed in the award and how to count it towards the overarching award. Generally, again, what I would tell you is if you have concerns that you're running up to the, the the general SBA guidance or hard cap or whatever you'd like to call it, reach out to your, reach out to the specific institute that you are likely to be assigned to or that you're going to be assigned to based on your phase two. Because again, each different institute may have different flexibilities with regards to the budget. And so it's really important that you reach out to the specific institute to discuss your budget. But as far as how to count the, the technical and business assistance in the proposal, if you look at the SF424 instructions, and I know they're long, I know it's kind of, it's an, a, they can be a little bit of an, a cure for insomnia, but they're a wealth of information. And um, if you're looking for specifics, you can actually search for technical assistance and the whole paragraph on how to count that in the budget will come right up. Thank you. You mentioned TABA. Can you have both a TABA and a CRP? 
So you can't actually, the CRP program does not allow, so when I was, so the CRP is not considered a phase two, interestingly enough. So you can't have, you can't ask for TABA funds as part of a CRP. That's because technical assistance is, is part of the CRP already. You can include those as, as core costs of the CRP. That's, that technical assistance is a core component of that program. Let me, let me clarify that though, because this does get confusing. So uh, you can have TABA and the CLP, providing that the TABA is not in the CLP application. So what I mean by that, if you have a phase two, maybe the precursor to CLP, or maybe a completely separate project that's a phase two, for that separate project or for that precursor, you can uh, apply for TABA funds. You just can't ask for TABA funds in this as part of the CLP. That's a great clarification, Todd. So that the, the, if you're asking for technical and business assistance that is attached and that was part of a phase two and then you ask for a CRP, that's okay. But you can't ask for technical and business assistance as part of your CRP application. Thank you. Are the budget limits direct cost only or indirect plus direct? So in general, in the, in the SBIR and STTR programs, when we talk about budget guidelines, we're talking total cost. That's different from a lot of other NIH programs. The rest of NIH likes to talk in direct costs. So generally, when you're looking at something in the SBIR and STTR, it'll talk about total costs. And that's direct, indirect, and the fee. Thank you. We've heard from a number of institutes today. Do you have a table showing the range of funding from programs? So in the general omnibus solicitation, and the most recent one was just released, there is specific information about the program descriptions and research topics for all the institutes and centers within the NIH, CDC, and FDA. And so within that document, you can go to a specific institute and center and it actually charts out how they accept clinical trials, what are the specifics with regards to their program. So I encourage individuals, if you have an inkling of which institute you're likely to be assigned to, if this is the first award for you, since we do have a number of different participants on today, or if you're doing, you have a phase two, um, you know the institute that you're currently assigned, read that document. It's, again, it has a, a lot of information about the specifics around specific institute and center programs. Also, if you are looking for specific funding opportunities that are SBR, STTR, cost, if you look at this current slide and the third bullet down the NIH guide, you can actually look through the NIH guide and filter by just SBI, current SBI and STTR funding opportunities across the NIH. So that's another good resource for you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is the technical assistance above the budgetary cap or is it only allowed as long as the budget remains under the SBIR cap? So again, this is, and this is very similar to the other question that was how do you treat the, the technical and business assistance? In, the specific in a specific application. And again, each institute and center has specific guidelines around what they will or will not allow over, again, the, these SBA guidelines. And so it's important to reach out to your specific program um, officer, the specific SBA or STTR contact to, to ask about what budgets that specific institute allows. Some budgets of uh, some institutes are much more flexible than others. And so I'm gonna call out, for example, I know um, NINDS uh, from personal experience tends to be very flexible with regards to budgets, tends to allow much larger budgets than some of the other institutes. And so it's fairly important to reach out and talk to the individual institute, talk about your specific budget if you find you're coming up to that, uh, the SBA guidelines. Yeah, I'll say at the NIA, we would allow that $50,000 phase two or 8,000 phase one um, TABA to go above the total cap that we say, but um, that's for the NIA. I'm listing in the uh, chat section, the link to the NINDS budget guidance. As you'll see, NINDS has a number of pre-approved waiver topics. If your project were to fall into these waiver topics, you potentially could request a budget that is larger than the Small Business Administration hard cap. 
um, within the guidance set at that, at that site. And I think if you uh, were to contact the appropriate program officials at the Institute, you may see that they have uh, similar policies or at least be able to give you guidance on their own um, budget guidelines. Yeah, and, and for NCATS as well too, we, we certainly have a wide ranging um, um, waiver topics that we can, uh, that your project will, you'll probably be working in because they're written so broadly. So, so uh, that, that also works. And, and um, uh, regarding the, the fees, yeah, we, we do not count them as part of that, uh, those uh, uh, budget caps. So, uh, but again, you know, I'll, I'll keep saying this, have a conversation with us before you apply, just to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, we can support what you're, what you're proposing in the, uh, in your application. Yeah, and I'll say the same for NIA in terms of the waiver topics, uh, you know, and it's not just necessarily the NIA waiver topics. We and many other institutes will allow as long as you, uh, you know, fit any waiver topic from the NIH, then then they will allow you to go up to, at least for NIA, we will allow you to go up to whatever cap we set in the funding opportunity. So those caps, like for the Alzheimer's disease funding opportunity of 500,000 for phase one as an example, that's, that's the cap for any project, which is really almost any Alzheimer's project that we get that fits the waiver topics. And our waiver topics for Alzheimer's are broad to include those. Thank you, everyone. How can we access prior commercialization plans to use as a guideline and for budget proposals? That's a great question. And as Todd uh, discussed at sbir.nih.gov, if you go under resources, there are sample applications. And some of those sample applications do are phase two sample applications or fast track sample applications that have a commercialization plan in them. So top link on this slide. Thank you. Is there support for device development such as support to prepare an IDE or a 510K? So with regards to the, the CRP and the phase 2B, depending upon the specifics of what you're planning to propose, that could fall within one of those, um, one of those programs. Again, if you've got a specific request, you're trying to figure out what's the best possible way for me to support um, preclinical, pre-IDE um, work and then moving to the clinic, there may be also specific programs at, um, at the different institutes that can support your specific project. So for example, if you are thinking about doing a project and you're not quite sure, you know, should I go for a CRP? Should I go for a phase 2B? Is there some other opportunity that an institute provides? That's when you can reach out to your program official. What's interesting is that I think Lily kind of touched on this with regards to bridges. So there are SBIR specific programs, but there are often programs that are open to more than just SBIRs. And so some of the institutes may steer you towards a program that might not be SBIR or STTR specific, but may allow companies and might be the best fit for your program or your project as well. So I don't know, Emily, if you want to jump in because I know NINDS, for example, has specific programs for um, ID and IDE enabling studies and then a small clinical study associated with it. Absolutely. So at NINDS, besides the, uh, the grant-based mechanisms of phase one and phase two, we also do participate in cooperative agreement mechanisms, for instance, through the Translational Neural Devices Program. Um, this is a, a U44 mechanism that is specific to small businesses, but is part of a larger program that is phased and allows uh, projects to have a first phase to get an IDE and then to continue on to the clinical trial portion in a second phase. Um, so that's an example of, of a somewhat unique program offered at NINDS. And again, um, once you know what institute your project would fall under, your specific program official at that institute could help to direct you to specific programs such as that. Thank you, everyone. We're going to move into a couple of questions about eligibility. Can CRP start before the end of a phase two, but end after a phase two? They can. So that's the neat part about a CRP, is that they can start before the phase two has ended, before that 
project has concluded, you can start the CRP and then have it extend beyond the end of the phase two. And, and I'll just say straight out, there, there were some applicants that have contacted us that tried to do that in the past. And, and that was a bit of an issue, the way the funding opportunity was set up. So if, if that's whoever's asking the question, you know, the, the new funding opportunity that was recently released that uh, Stephanie mentioned um, does now clearly allow for that. Yes, we did try to fix um, a couple of the issues there that were originally prohibiting that. Thank you. May a nonprofit organization apply for a CRP? No, so the CRP still, again, because you need to have had a phase two SBIR or STTR in order to get the CRP, you need to fall under the eligibility guidance of the SBIR and STTR programs. Thank you. And I'm just going to ask if we can go back to the CRP and phase two slide. We've got a number of questions asking me about the difference between the two and that might help. I um, imagined. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And, and you'll see there's a number of questions about the timing. So I just wanted to flag for folks so you can see some of those details there. Um, how many times can you apply for a CRP or resubmit? So similar to, and again, this is kind of a standard NIH policy. You get a, you can submit and then you get a resubmission. You'll see an A1. Um, and so if you want to think about it, you do get kind of, I don't want to call it two shots on goal um, for, for the CRP. And that's similar to the phase 2B and that's similar to uh, many of our programs if you're trying to um, do a competing continuation or, you know, the CRP, it's, it's two times. Thank you. And I promise to give some specific questions we received from Kira. Um, can you use your technology to evaluate brain problems and other diseases? Uh, yes, we believe we can. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Alzheimer's and mild cognitive impairment is our lead and initial focus, but we are exploring um, application of the technology to other uh, brain health conditions, including other neurodegenerative diseases, neurodevelopmental diseases, um, uh, uh, TBI, um, and so on, yes. Thank you. And what are you doing to bring a statistical vigor to your test? For example, adding metabolites. Um, sure, this is a great question. Uh, uh, statistics in general, I would say, is very important for applications as well as for a working model and ultimate test. So uh, very early on, uh, right now we are a larger team, but we started as a three member team and one of the three was biostatistician. And uh, uh, so, so, so he uh, initially was doing all the uh, work in terms of uh, sample sizing, uh, developing uh, 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 our own algorithm and software, uh, and so on. And now the next step is, and this is a study that we are currently running that is being supported by ADDF in partnership with Gates Foundation, where we are looking at associations of our uh, microRNA biomarkers with other uh, uh, markers uh, of Alzheimer's disease, including amyloid tau, APOE, um, and other analytes and metabolites such as cholesterol and, 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 and other risk factors. So uh, we don't have this data yet, uh, but it is complementary to, to, to other works that uh, we are doing, including under, under phase 2B. Thank you. Stephanie, we're getting a number of questions about the match requirements. Um, do we need to have match funding in the bank in order to match and secure the phase 2B? So a first quick clarification is that it's encouraged, not required. So um, if, and I would encourage anyone um, who is interested in doing a phase 2B to look at the specific funding opportunities. 
So the individual institutes, when they put out their specific program announcements, they will have specific language associated with what um, they anticipate is either encouraged or required with regards to their specific program announcements. For the general omnibus solicitation, again, there's new language in the omnibus solicitation that specifically talks about um, commercial potential and the, uh, that it will be considered in review. And applicants are really um, encouraged to secure that independent third party investor funds to show and validate that commercial potential. That said, it's not required if you can show commercial potential in some other means and really, really indicate that you, again, have the ability to take it forward, make it a commercial product, you're going to have to make that argument in your commercialization plan. But third party funding is strongly encouraged. Now, what does that mean? If you go into the omnibus solicitation, you'll find that, again, there's a wide variety of options other companies, a venture capital firm, angel investors, things that you might immediately think when you think third party investors, that's what we're talking about. But it also includes foundations, universities, state and local government. So there's a lot of flexibility with regards to what is that additional funding look like. I will state that it can be, so that third party funding, um, historically we found um, in when other institutes have done this in the past, it can be something that is contingent on the phase 2B. So if your third party funder says, if you get this, I will give you this amount of money, that's appropriate as well. But you do need to show that there is a, a and that should be part of that letter of support indicating that yes, if you receive the phase 2B funding, you, we will give you this additional third party funding. Or, you know, if we receive this phase 2B funding, this is the additional in-kind resources, whatever it is, to show, again, showing that commercial potential, showing that you can bring it the rest of the way. And that's because the phase 2B is really supposed to, again, lead to, it's that second phase two, to help lead to that inflection point, lead to that additional partner, investor, or commercialization or you know or the final product thank you and can you clarify whether a matching funding is encouraged for phase one or phase two we've received a couple of questions about that as well so i have seen situations where individuals have some kinds of matching funding or have additional third-party funding in a phase one or a phase two it is certainly not required we actually don't even it's not even encouraged it's certainly not um a, a part uh, and something that we anticipate particularly for phase ones again phase ones are supposed to be a feasibility study we will occasionally see that in the phase two, and I can have Emily and, and Todd and Lily talk to the frequency but they see that. But again, the thing that we're encouraging it for is the phase two B. Um, we don't actually have that language at all associated with the phase one or phase two. One thing I would encourage in phase one and phase two applications, if you don't have you know investor funding in on board, but letters of support from potential investors that say, you know, there's not enough data yet, we're not ready yet, but if the company can meet the milestones in this project, we would seriously consider investment. A letter like that can really help in terms of competitiveness and telling us that, you know, that this is, this project is leading to a key value inflection point and that there are investors waiting for you to meet that value inflection point. So letters like that can really help uh, your competitiveness. Yeah, Thank I you. Go ahead. I was just going to say that I, I completely agree with both Stephanie and, and Todd's point on in a phase one or phase two, any inclusion of, of letters of support that are from external funders that may not be provide commitment, but um, show support can really be helpful in showing that commercial potential, um, but by no means are matching funds expected at that level. Uh, really, really the same message. Yeah, I, I have nothing to add. I agree with everything that's just been said. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Next question is for NENS. We just completed a phase two from NENS and we had some bottlenecks to carry out on one of the aims of phase two. Can we apply for phase two B to complete that remaining work, including? 
Oh, Monique, I, I missed the end of that, but I think this is a case where it, it would be good to have a specific conversation about you know, the exact project and to understand the exact situation and whether a phase 2B or other mechanisms might be the more appropriate avenue. So I would just recommend reaching out to um, your program officer, which is likely to be either uh, myself or Natalie. Thank you. A few questions on intellectual property. Do we need to have an approved patent to apply for an STTR? So the answer there is no. So this is some of the, and this I'm assuming you mean for a phase one STTR. Correct. And you don't need to have, um, there isn't a requirement around intellectual property. That said, we generally do encourage people to speak with a, a patent attorney or speak with an advisor in that area. Again, I'm not an IP lawyer. Um, Todd, Emily, and Lily aren't IP lawyers unless they're hiding something from me. Um, so, you know, it's, it's usually important to, to talk with um, talk with someone. And if you're doing an STTR, likely you're connected with the university. So you can maybe talk through university tech transfer. Many of our phase one awardees will file a provisional before they apply. That's fairly common, but again, not required. Yeah. And, and Stephanie, I want to add that if you do get funded, please note that your abstract or, or at least the, their abstract that, uh, for, uh, for the application is going to get published on a public website, uh, NIH Reporter. So if there are things there that would lead somebody skilled in the art to make an assumption of what you're doing, um, you know, again, that's where talking to your a patent attorney and getting advice, but, but just recognize that if you do get funded, uh, your award, uh, aspects of your award in terms of that abstract, that public abstract will be made available for the world to see, which, which constitutes a public disclosure um, for IP. It's a really important point, Lily. Agreed. Thank you. Can technical assistance be used to fund patent work? So yes, I mean, technical assistance um, can be used to do some of the work associated with patenting. And again, I would encourage you to read the SF424 instructions specifically associated with technical and business assistance, or as it's affectionately known, TABA. And, um, and, and that might help provide some additional information. Um, in addition, you can always reach out to your specific program officer. And, uh, and we will, we are looking to um, hopefully include some additional question, Q&A about uh, TABA on our website, hopefully shortly. Thank you. We'll move over to some questions about resources and programs. You mentioned earlier in this presentation that there are resources for minority, um, potentially for minority researchers and entrepreneurs. Can you please elaborate on what's available for this audience? Yeah, so the applicant assistance program is definitely a key. I know that um, both the NINDS and the NIA specifically participate in that. Um, Lily, I'm not sure if NCATS will be participating. We, we in that. will be, yeah. Uh, starting um, after the next solicitation date, we are going to be participating. So, yes. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so all three of the institutes represented today will be, will then be participating, two of us are now. So, um, we can send out the link to the uh, web page with applicant assistance program and a contact point and in at NIA it will be Stephanie Davis um, who will be the contact point um, at the NIA for the applicant assistance program. If you're interested in applying, you can feel free to let her know. Um, that will be released once every submission date. In addition, if you've got a current SBIR or STTR award, we have specific supplements. We have a specific diversity supplement for SBIRs and STTRs to encourage um, the you know, mentorship and training and entrepreneurship in, um, of underrepresented groups and, and basically bringing under individuals from underrepresented groups on board uh, to your company. And so I'd encourage you to take a look at that and I will put um, the link to that program announcement in the chat shortly. Um, and I'd encourage you, if you've got an active award, take a look at that supplement. Yeah, and I, I will say for NIA, we set aside more funding for that than, uh, you know, 
applications that fit that we get. So, you know, we would love to see more diversity supplement applications. So, um, you know, but you need to submit those relatively early and you you know, you can't be submitted once you're in no cost extension or about to enter a no cost extension. So you want to think ahead with that type of thing. To echo that, NINDS is also very enthusiastic about supporting diversity supplements and we very much encourage the community to take advantage of that program. Thank you. And I just wanted to know um, the NIH uh, SBR sites uh, have information about the social economically disadvantaged businesses, women owned businesses, as well as minorities. So um, if you're interested in learning more about um, those, please do visit the website. Uh, we received a few questions about that. Um, I also wanted to ask a question about mentorship and whether there's a mentorship program available. Yeah, so this would vary uh, across the ICs. One of the resources that is available through SEED and uh, will be shortly available at the NIA specifically too is the Entrepreneurs in Residence. And while these wouldn't be you know, your specific mentor, they are business development experts that can be available if you have business development related questions. And I think is, a, is an excellent resource that uh, you are able to tap into. Um, Stephanie, I don't know if you want to say anything more there. I actually do. I mean, I, I, so the, the, it's interesting because that's a, a very general question and there's several different opportunities that are available. So if you're a phase one awardee, there is the i program um, or the C3I po program. Both of those are um, entrepreneurial training program. They do encourage, they, they do have mentors associated with them. They are hands-on, you know, kind of helping you, particularly if you're in the early stages. Again, you may have never done this before. They can be very helpful in helping your company start out, helping start out within the SBI or these TTR programs. As Todd mentioned, we have entrepreneurs and residents we also do have a regulatory expert on staff as well, um, because again, many of our uh, applicants and many of our awardees, they, this may be their first time through the regulatory process and it's not for the faint of heart. So it's important to kind of get things in order and, and know what's gonna be needed. In addition, um, we do have those different opportunities associated with supporting companies to attend different partnering events um, or different um, investment events. And before we send someone to those events, we provide pitch coaching and we provide mentoring to help you make the most of that event, to make sure that you're prepared to attend and go to that event. And so, again, it's kind of all of these different things. It a little bit depends on your stage, depends on the specific situation, but we do try to have several touch points throughout. And again, some institutes have additional things that they offer, as, as Todd mentioned. So. If you're wondering, look, I, I had this award with another institute, you know, another institute, where should I go? What's available to me? Reach out and talk with your program officers. They'll know the different programs that are available, or you know, they'll know who to talk to to find all of your options. Also talk to your institutes about what you, what is your needs. I mean, I can say, you know, our office is now two years old. We've been Consistent, consistently thinking about how we could best help our Woody. So if, if we knew that some sort of mentoring program was a key need, then that would push us more in, in that direction to think about such a program. And I did want to see if, so Kira is an example of a company that did just present at one of those investor conferences and was pitch coached and mentored by the entrepreneurs of residence. So I want to see if you wanted to add anything there. Yes, uh, um, I, I can say that our experience was very positive. Uh, we went into the sessions with open mind and I think that was uh, uh, very helpful. We, uh, as I shared with all of you, uh, we've been in this uh, uh, you know, program and business since 2013. So we do have a, a, a presentation, we do have executive summary and so on and so forth. But I think those sessions with entrepreneurs and residents at the NIH really help us improve the messaging. They worked with us on slightly different angles, like for example, elevator pitch, 
four minute pitch. Uh, we made a video uh, and we added, as a result of these sessions, we added a couple of key slides to our general presentation. So despite the fact that uh, our presentation has been evolving over the years and, uh, uh, and it, it has been looked at by various parties, those sessions really uh, added values. So, so, and then, uh, um, yeah, through, 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 through that program, we also participated in, in uh, RESI, which uh, was a very productive uh, conference for us. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to move over to uh, some COVID-related questions. Can you speak to the effect of uh, COVID on funding deadlines? And do you expect any change in SBR funding due to the COVID economy? Are pay lines changing? So I would encourage anyone who has specific questions um, about, the, about COVID and COVID-19, there's a specific website for NIH applicants and recipients um, of, of SBIR and, and uh, of any NIH grants and applications and awards that is available on the website. And I'm going to put that um, in the link shortly when I'm done speaking. So that details any announcements with regards to, you know, any changes um, related to COVID-19. With regards to the, um, the application deadline. So there was a lot of specific misinformation around the last application deadline. So the last application deadline in April didn't change um, our late policy. We had a very specific late policy associated with it, but the application deadline itself did not move. So again, the next application deadline is going to be September 8th. Now, usually it's September 5th, but it's a long holiday weekend, which pumps, bumps it to September 8th. So the next receipt date is September 8th. And again, if you've got any specific questions or you want the most up-to-date information on um, anything with regards, any policies or associated with COVID-19, I'm gonna put the link uh, in the chat box here shortly. In addition, that website, it has different program announcements and different programs and funding opportunities that are related to COVID-19. So it's a wealth of information, it's updated daily, and I'd strongly encourage you to read through it. Thank you. Um, I'll take one more question and then I will encourage everyone to fill out the feedback form. Um, with a lot of the funding focused on adults and aging, are pediatric research applications encouraged under this umbrella? This is for Todd. Yeah, so, we have the National Institute of uh, Child Health and Development. Um, might have the acronym slightly wrong, but uh, they would be the ones that would do most of the pediatric development. Of course, it depends on the disease area as well. Um, for example, if it was heart disease, it would be NHLBI, or pediatric cancer, it would be NCI. But um, it, it doesn't usually fall directly into NIH's mission, but there are several areas within NIH where pediatric diseases do fall into. Um, I want to note that at NINDS, we do support a number of, of pediatric indications. So there's a number of um, pediatric epilepsy uh, is one. There's neurogenetic disorders that are specific to pediatric populations, um, and those might be applicable to NINDS. And for NCATS, uh, rare diseases, um, um, genetic rare diseases that uh, uh, fall, fall into that category clearly are things that we're interested in funding and many of those specifically affect children. So yeah, I, I, again, I would check with us on what, depending on the disease indication that you're working on. Thank you. I'll add one more just because I think it's so important. Uh, someone is, a few folks are unclear on what is technical assistance. What type of work does this actually fund? So that's a great question. And if you look at the, um, the CRP FOA, so those funding opportunity announcements, we actually have specific bullets kind of helping describe what does technical assistance mean? What might be included as part of technical assistance? And I kind of flew through some of those in my talk, uh, but it's 
you know, development of a regulatory strategy. Again, you know, thinking about an intellectual property strategy, and that could include analysis of a patent landscape. Um, it, as was noted um, by um, Michael today, technical assistance associated with manufacturing, that's all part of the CRP. And so uh, it could be other, other technical assistance, including market research can be part of the CRP. So again, it's a little bit different from the standard SBR and STCR program that doesn't include some of these activities, the CRP does. And so it's, I would encourage you to take a look at those bullets. And again, if you have any questions, that's where it's really important to reach out to a program official. I know we keep saying it over and over and over again. Um, and so maybe if, if, this, if that was the last question, I wanna end with reach out, talk with us, um, talk with us well in advance. Uh, the program officials are really important a great and important resource as you're putting together your application. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna quickly answer one more question I just saw, uh, which is there were <laughs> questions about um, how do you get sent to investor showcases and things like that. There is a call that goes out to all current companies about twice a year, but also if you are interested, we will consider applications outside of that call. So again, reach out to us and uh, we are happy to see what we can do. I guess that's sure. the theme of this web of this <laughs> webinar, isn't it? Yeah. Reach out and t reach out and talk to us. We'd love to hear from you. <laughs> and just uh, related to that, please do it early. Um, many of us program officials, our calendars get booked out the weeks leading up to the submission dates. We highly encourage you to be reaching out several weeks, six weeks in advance of that deadline, so that we can get you on the calendar before that submission deadline. So please and do not delay. And be patient. It may take us a few patient. days to respond to your email. Um, most of us are not in the office, so email is definitely going to be much more effective than phone calls. Um, so you can always email us, and then if it's something that needs a call, we can schedule a call. That's not a problem. But email is always the best way to first set that up. Um, and give us a few days to be able to respond to that email. Please. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to my enthusiastic panelists, Dr. Heim. Uh, Stephanie Fertig, Lily Portilla, Dr. Caparello, Dr. Botling, and Dr. Shenerman. Um, I want to let you know that we have included contacts. Uh, what you've heard is a recurring theme is that this is just the beginning. We're going to be continuing these workshop series. We want to hear what you want to learn more about. So please fill out that feedback form and please do reach out to us. We're really wanting to establish a connecting point with you to help you. Ultimately, we want you to be successful and we want to see new innovations out in the market and helping people. Uh, so please do reach out and uh, stay connected with us. You can follow us on Twitter, join our email list and uh, feel free to contact us at any time with your questions. Thank you to my panelists. Thank you to the institutes and to our uh, successful awardees. May you be well and please uh, continue to reach out and connect with us. Take care. Thank you all. Thank Bye. you everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.